thanks for coming out. Thanks for having us. You guys uh, ready to have some fun tonight? Yeah. All right. My name's Mark. I'm one of the volunteers here. Hi, Mark. I've got another, another uh, number of other volunteers around here wearing white buttons, some without. Have everybody raise your hands. Raise your hands. Volunteers, volunteers, raise your hands. Look at that. Some that are seated. Yeah. Some that are hiding over here. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Uh, I think we have a really good uh, presentation for you tonight. This is going to be an interactive and mostly for the kids. So that's why you guys are up front here. Okay? Mm -hmm. Who wants to crush some pop cans tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Crystal Finley. Crystal is a uh, manufacturing engineer um, where I work at Fall Aerospace. She's worked on a number of space programs, um, SBSS and COMS, and um, a couple of others. A couple others that I'm sure you've heard of. But uh, she likes to um, do presentations, on you know, hands-on kind of presentations <coughs> for kids in the school, and that's how I found out about her. So, and we had a little thing on our, our newspaper at school at work, and that's how I found out about her. I asked her to come down and do this. I'm not going to blather on a whole lot more than to just say. Welcome to Crystal, and let's let you get going here. Hi. Thank you. So how this got started, I went to the Museum of Nature and Science in Denver, and I saw a great presentation on atmospheric pressure. I thought, I have an excellent science background, and I learned something that day. And I went, that is a great presentation, and so I copied it. <laughs> so here I am to tell you about atmospheric pressure and a lot of people don't really know much about atmospheric pressure. So here, come on up here and just press this onto the table. All right? I'm sure a lot of you recognize these. Now try to pull it, push down real hard. Now pull up. All right? Can you pull it up? Why? Okay, feel it. Will you guys pass these around? Here you go, pass these around. And you can, if you find a flat surface, push onto it. And it's not sticky, but it sticks. Right? What happens when you drink out of a glass bottle and your tongue gets stuck up in there? Why is that? Right? I'm sure you've all had that. Well, atmospheric pressure is the weight of all of the air pushing down on us. Right? Just like if you had a whole stack of kids on top of you, we have a whole stack of air on top of us. And that's basically what atmospheric pressure is. It's just the weight of all those air molecules pushing down on us. Well, oops, my little posters are having some difficulty staying up. So, did you get it? Yep. So, when you get all the air out of that, all the air around you is pushing on it so hard that you can't pull it up. And that is called a vacuum. Right? And it's really strong. It's amazingly strong. So what I brought tonight to show atmospheric pressure is I brought a vacuum pump which gets rid of the pressure. Right? So have you guys ever seen a vacuum in your closet? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's just a fancy one. Right? And I have a bell jar right there. So, what do you think will happen if I put a balloon with just, not you, because you have done this before and I know you have, so I am not going <laughs> to let you answer all the questions, because you know. <laughs> yeah, so all I did with this little balloon is I just put a little bit of air in it. So without saying anything, I want you to think about what will happen and I just stick it in here. Now the reason I have it in the glass jar is because it'll stick into the vacuum right there. So and I'm going to put my bell jar on top. Right? And this is going to seal. I'm going to make sure all my valves are shut the right way. I'm going to turn on the vacuum pump. So all this is, it really, it's just a vacuum and it's pulling the air out of my bell jar so that it's evacuating the air from inside. Why is that happening? <laughs> not you! I know you know. That's not fair. How about you? You don't know? Do you know? 
it's sort of like it's pulling out. Do you know? No. No? Over here. Oh, here, one more. What's it? Do you know? How about you? Um, that is a good idea, but that is not it. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the reason why is because when you suck all the air out, uh -huh. there's pressure built up on the inside, but. Take out all the air. So the pressure on the inside of the balloon is greater than the pressure outside of the balloon. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Because what happened is when I blew this up, I blew it up in what's called ambient pressure, the pressure all around us. But all those little air molecules, they're just like people with big brothers. They don't like to be too close to each other. Right? They're like, please don't get too close to me. And that is exactly how air is. It doesn't really want to be that close to each other, but because we have all this weight of all this pressure, it's forced to be right next to each other, just like your siblings. So I want you guys to think about this as like a cell, right? So I don't know if you know what these are. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. They're very popular. Okay, so what is, so we know what it is, what is a marshmallow made out of? Sugar. That's right, and a lot of air, air. There's a lot of air in marshmallows, right? So what do you think is going to happen to my marshmallow in your head? Use your inside your head voice. <laughs> Can you see? You can see? Okay. Okay, so it expanded, but then it stopped expanding and then it started getting smaller. What was going on? What's that? What did that happen? That's pretty crazy, isn't it? So. What happened? The air, the more, <coughs> the more bigger it got, the more, the more air was in it, and the more smaller it got, the less air was in it. Yeah. And what happened to all those little air pockets inside our marshmallow? It got stuck. What? It got what? It got up. Well, the little cells burst. There's a whole bunch of little tiny these in there but the cell wall is made out of sugar so when it gets too much it bursts and then the air is able to go out right so you can pass this around do not eat it because think of all these dirty fingers that it's going to go through <laughs> so now i want you to think about that so that is a rigid cell wall but it's all little pockets of air now, I know all you guys are already shaving, right? <laughs> no? This shaving cream. Oh, no. oh my gosh, this is so cool. I know this one. <laughs> I am never going to a movie with him. <laughs> oh, he's got it on video. It's going to be on the website for the observatory. Okay, so here is shaving cream. So hold on. What is shaving cream made out of? How about you on your dad's lap? What do you think shaving cream is made out of? Have you ever played with shaving cream? You have? What is it? <gasps> you don't know. Do you know? It's soap and water and a lot of air. So it's a lot like a marshmallow, except for the cell walls are made out of soap. And what's the difference between a sugary cell wall and a soapy cell wall. Not you. <laughs> well, it's kind of 
dramatic. <laughs> so why did that happen? Why did that happen? It's basically the same thing with the balloon. But why did it get so big? It's an elastic cell wall. So the bubbles could get bigger. Just like when you blow bubbles, you know, in your sink. Exactly. Oh, and it all goes. So what do you think would happen if I put a rock in there? It would not break. It wouldn't break. Yeah. It probably wouldn't do anything. There's not a lot of air in rocks, except for maybe pumice, which has a lot of air in it. So there's maybe some geologists here, Ooh. right? So what if I put some metal in there? What would happen? I don't think that's going to be awesome. Yeah. It can do nothing. So atmospheric pressure doesn't really affect things that are solid. Well, like metal and things like that. So. What do you think about liquids? Liquids? What do you think about that? What do you think? What? Bubbles? Why do you think there'd be bubbles? Yeah, bigger and puffier? It is water. Just plain old water that I got right here. Actually, usually my daughter is my assistant. I have a 14 year old daughter. Nothing. nothing at all. There's the vacuum starting. So I want you to think about this. What are you guys made out of? Air. You're made out of water. So a lot of what a spacesuit does is creates pressure and breathable air so that you do not do that when you're out in space. Right? That is what happens. You have to be very happy about our atmosphere because our atmosphere is what is allowing liquid water on our planet. If it wouldn't, it would all dissipate away. Right? Because it would go from a liquid state to a gaseous state which we call boiling. So, come here. What temperature do you think it's gonna be? Same. Put your finger in there. What temperature is it? Cold. It's cold, that's right. So, do you guys cook? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Does it take a long time to boil your macaroni and cheese? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that it's faster at sea level? No. It is, because there's more pressure at sea level. And so the, the lower you are, the lower in altitude you are, the more atmospheric pressure there are, so you have to heat up your water to a higher temperature to get it to boil. So at a very high altitude, like way up in the mountains here in Colorado, it boils a lot cooler temperature, so it takes longer to cook your noodles. All right, so have you guys felt that when you've been going up into the mountains, how your ears get all funny? And they pop. That's atmospheric pressure, you can feel it. The other thing is, have you ever noticed how dry it is here and how your skin dries out really quickly? <laughs> Atmospheric pressure is, got, is one, of the thing, one of the factors. It is very dry here. Our climate is very dry, but also because we're at a very high altitude, your skin actually evaporates faster because you don't have all that pressure holding it in on you. Does that mean I die faster? What? Does that mean I die faster? You die faster? I don't know. You desiccate faster. <laughs> So, so it is a really powerful force, like really super duper duper powerful. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to take down my poster so you can see. And in turn, you guys will all get a chance to implode a pop can because I brought a lot of them. So I'm going to see, I believe they're all boiling. Oops, no, they're not quite boiling yet. I'm going to turn up my little stove. They're not quite boiling. So. The funny thing is, where do we build satellites? Oh, I know. Where? I don't know. On Earth? <laughs> where? We build them on Earth and then we um, build them out of space. 
that's right. In fact, he and I both work at the place where we build satellites, right? And we built a lot of really great satellites, and, but we build them here on Earth, and then we send them out where there's no atmospheric pressure. So we have to keep in mind atmospheric pressure. So actually, let's start with one that you guys might have heard of. So, so have you guys heard of Kepler? Yes. Kepler's a really great satellite. Have you guys heard of Google Earth? No. No? Have you guys heard of <coughs> that? Have you guys never seen pictures of the planet that oh, you I use have. on your iPhones and things like that? Well, Ball built a bunch of satellites to take those pictures. So a lot of those pictures are taken. And those satellites are built right in Boulder by probably some of your neighbors. So it's pretty interesting. So this is Kepler, and it looks for habitable planets. So that's a picture of the satellite. And the most famous satellite is Hubble. But Hubble really kind of looks just like a mailbox, like a big mailbox. Yeah. So I don't actually bring pictures of it because it's kind of not that exciting to look at. But, and Kepler has been in the news so much that I thought I would bring a poster about it. So here are some of the planets that Kepler has looked at. And this is a picture of the light transit. So you can see, here's the star, and it shows where the little planet goes across and how the light signature, and that's how they figure out. So I have to tell you, I don't actually know much about this. There's other people in the audience right there who know a lot about these things. And so usually I suggest is if you have, you're interested in these things, you should go to the NASA website because the NASA website is excellent and has more information than you can digest in a lifetime. It's just amazing how much information there. And this is, a, I think it was a really beautiful picture of a planet with two suns. Yeah, I'm thinking that they probably don't have too much liquid water on that little planet. By the way, the insides of the Hubble Space Telescope are very exciting. Yes. And most of the instruments on board Hubble were built at Ball. Yes, that's true. And in fact, I was on the project too. The last upgrade of the Hubble, I got to work on. And the exciting thing was, is astronauts came and actually personally thanked us for our work. So it was really exciting. And the Hubble is the most famous uh, scientific instrument ever. I was in Africa, and the most way out in the bush people knew about Hubble. Like it is such a famous instrument all over the world because those pictures are everywhere and it's such an amazing instrument. Yes? Do you know if that's related? Is that cat zooming right there? I really don't know. You've got to ask. You should try and look for Obi Wan Kenobi. Well, that's true. <laughs> Actually I um, so it's interesting, I was listening to a talk about a physics teacher talking about applied math. I must be a big nerd that I would listen to an applied math lecture. But what it was, it was about math in itself is sometimes not that interesting, but applied math is really interesting. And one of the things that they calculated was how much energy it would take to get Luke Skywalker's Starcraft out of the swamp <laughs> on Dagobah. How much energy would that take? So what they had to do is they had to figure out the gravity of the planet, the weight of the, of the ship, and it takes about the same energy to get it out of the swamp and over to the shore as to power a small tractor. A Just thought you'd want to know that. <laughs> Just use the force. Use the force. Yes. That's why you use the tractor to pull it out. So this is soon to be an incredibly famous satellite. This is the James Webb Telescope and it's going to take the place of the Hubble. So if you see on the bottom, this is a life-size model. Look at those tiny people. This thing is huge. So the Hubble is only 300 miles up. It's really close and this is going to be sent out a lot further. Why would you want to send a satellite out further? What do you think? Here. Uh, because you can discover more stuff. And what do you think would be the difference between closer and further from the Earth? Closer you... Yeah, go ahead. Okay, closer you get a uh, pretty close image. Far away you get like, smaller images with more planets and stars and that sort of stuff. The difference between uh, 300 miles from the Earth and 1,000 miles from the Earth is nothing compared to the distance of these stars. 
It has to do with the atmosphere and the clarity. All right, so you want it really far out so you have the best clarity. Are you being for your brother? Oh, your brother's back there. I thought you two were together. Oh. So what's really interesting is, so here's the mirrors. These are beryllium. And beryllium, what's, and they're coated with gold. These are no cheap mirrors. They, beryllium is important because it does not contract and expand with temperature. So that's really important because when you're in the sunlight, it's really, really, really hot. And when you're not, it's really, really, really cold. So this is an artist rendition of it deployed, and I highly suggest you go to the NASA website and watch the video of the James Webb Telescope deploy, because it is really great. So here are the primary mirrors, here's the secondary mirror, and then it goes in here and here's the instrument. And then here's all the brains, the star trackers, and um, so I want one of you guys to tell me what you think this thing is. You do know? Tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I think I've heard that before. Oh, no. Okay, here, you on the lap. What'd she say? Solar panels. That was an excellent guess because underneath are the solar panels. What do you think they are? Actually, these are to create, sh oh, do you know? That is exactly right. You, that is, I have never had anyone get it right. Good job. So yeah, that's the sun because what we want is we want these to stay a constant temperature and with these at a constant temperature you get better imaging. In fact, I went to a lecture yesterday about cryogenics and how you want to keep your um, infrared sensors at very, very low temperatures to be able to keep the detectors working properly. So temperature is really important. Yes, please ask questions. Oh, sorry. They're sun shields. They are the umbrella to keep the sun off the instrument. So the solar arrays are this way, and this is all insulation to keep the instruments cool and the array and the mirrors. Sorry about that. She answered, I was so excited she got it right that I... Okay, so what else do I have? Oh, and actually this is my favorite satellite. So the funny thing is when I got a job at Ball, I actually had no interest in space. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so OLI is a satellite I worked on, and it points at us. And other than spy satellites, which we also do, what I like this is because it has to do with land use and a lot of other things which are really important to us. So here is um, Las Vegas. This is in 1984, here's in 2008. That's a big difference in land use. So here is, um, this is Hurricane Katrina, and the green, um, green is healthy forest, and this is after the hurricane, and red is unhealthy forest, or devastated forest. So that tells you how much of the vegetation was destroyed in the hurricane. So um, they do a lot of things for water quality. I used to have a poster, which actually maybe I'll try to find again, about the forest fires here in Colorado, because they did a lot of predicting and resource allocation based on satellite imagery, and also the floods here. And this is um, the 2010 oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So the great thing is with satellite imagery, you can watch where things are moving and be able to allocate resources appropriately. So, and they really make great pictures, so you can look at Google Earth and go, oh, there's my house. <laughs> so, one of the things about atmospheric pressure is without atmospheric pressure, things vol they volatilize, which means that all of the things that be can become a gas do, and they dissipate. So we need to use lubricants and plastics so we, do, we have a lot of materials engineers, and they spend a lot of time figuring out what can go out into space and not migrate and not contaminate the optics. So we spend a lot of time doing analysis. And I'm actually not that smart, and I don't do any of it. So let me, I think we are ready for our pop cans. And so does anybody have any questions while I test my pop cans? All right, here we go.
So what do you think is going to happen to my pop can? It broke. It imploded. All I did was turned over a can that had a little bit of boiling water and I created a, a seal by putting it in the ice water. The water vapor liquefied because it became suddenly cold and that created a vacuum. So how many of you guys watch Mythbusters? Mythbusters? Well, a lot more of you should because that is awesome. <laughs> so they, yes, that's exactly the one I'm going to talk about. So, oops, I just got ice all over the place. So Mythbusters did a, they took a train car tanker. Like, it is huge. And those walls are like this thick. And they did the exact same experiment and crushed a train car. Atmospheric pressure is really powerful. So, pardon? Okay, so wait, do you want me to tell you what happened? Uh, all right, so here. Why don't you come up? Are you ready? So what I want you to do, whose parent, do you have a parent in here? <laughs> May he do this? Okay, so what I want you to do is just take this. I want you to pick up the can, right? Hold on, I'm gonna go through it with you. Pick up the can carefully, then you're gonna take it over here, and then quickly turn it over and, and put it in the ice water at the same time. You ready? Quick. Perfect. Wow. He is very good at this. Good job. Thank you. So, there's just boiling water in there. I put about this much water in there to create water vapor. The water vapor displaces all the air. When I turn the can over, it cools in the ice water that condenses the water vapor, and then it creates a vacuum. Okay, do you want to come do it? Would you create a seal? No. So what's the answer? Nothing will happen. That's right. So I have five more cans ready. Why don't we just start from the end? You can come up next. Now, whoever's kids these are, you parents are basically, by letting them come up here, are saying that you don't mind, they pick up a can with a little bit of boiling water. Okay, you ready? Okay. So, are you left-handed? Are you right-handed? I'm right-handed. Then you should do it with your right hand. Okay, so pick up the can. And come over here. And then turn it. Good job. Pretty good, huh? You will. You're going to do it in the next turn because what we're going to do is I have to boil more water. Okay, you ready? You get. You, you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Okay. So careful because that part's hot. So he didn't get a very good seal because he put it in at an angle, so it only partially crushed. Because I don't know if you heard the air go in. Yeah. Good job. Actually, it was better because you didn't do it quite as perfectly, and that way you get to explain an excellent thing. Because the seal is really important. Okay. Are you, do you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Actually, here, let me put this a little forward. Okay. I'm going to the roof here. So it really crushes it. So I was at CU, I don't know if any of you guys know this, but CU Boulder has a science lecture once a month, every month through the winter. It's called CU Wizards, and they have chemistry and physics exhibits. They have lectures for kids. I think it's the third Saturday of every month, and they're free. Even the parking in Boulder is free. It's a shock. You ready?
Did you drop it? Yeah, but he, it had already crushed. Okay, there's one more. You ready? All right, you have a question? Does it instantly cool when you put it in? Yeah. Instantaneously. Well, because aluminum is a really good conductor. So, quick. There you go. I have a question. Yeah. Explain why, with that much water in there, when they turn it upside down, a whole bunch more water comes out. Oh, out of here? Because the vacuum pulls water in. I didn't know where they did Yeah, they did. that's why. Good question. All right, so I'm going to prep more cans. So what other questions might you guys have? I can tell you that I did not start in the space industry. I often do this lecture to high school students because about jobs in the industry. So. Um, there's a lot of great jobs in aerospace in Colorado because we need electrical techs, we need welders, we need <coughs> model shop builders, we need maintenance people, we need computer people, we need everything. So it's a really great job, aerospace. Yes? Yeah? All right, let me, I'm going to do a little prep because it's, you know, everybody loves the pop cans. So, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Yeah? What's your question? She said it. What is it? You're just kidding? <laughs> I was so excited to have a really good question. Okay. What if the cans are boiled and you dump it in the hot water? What do you think? It won't do anything. It's a bum experiment, but you could try it. What happens if you do it with actual soda? With actual soda? The important thing is to create a vapor inside the can so that will condense and create the vacuum. What? <laughs> that was a good what. Okay, so you have to boil water, which becomes a water vapor, which will get all their other air out, so that when you get it cold really quick, it condenses and creates a vacuum, because there's no air inside the can. Yeah. You should be my tech ed teacher at school, like an assistant. I only like my own children. <laughs> the uh, so let's see, I'm trying to think of some other things that I often talk about during my lecture. I know you guys are also very excited to go and look at the actual telescope. Yes. So the CU CU Wizards webpage. Yes. So the show is tomorrow morning at nine thirty. That's correct. Yeah, it's a chemistry one. And uh, yeah, I was supposed to take my kids there, but um, they're teenagers and they got jobs. So now I don't get to go to as many lectures. I liked them, I think, more than they did. <laughs> I would, but I go to Boulder every day, so then I'm kind of I kind of get sick of going to Boulder. So I'm trying to think of something else that you guys might be interested. In. So you guys use your phones at all? Do you guys have phones? No. So you don't? Do you ever? Do you ever see your parents? getting directions someplace, and they're sitting there go, where is that? Where is that? GPS. It's GPS, that's right. I know how that works. You do? Yeah, you you all, tell them. There's always four satellites above you that's tracking the GPS, at least four satellites. And they triangulate and figure out where you are and <coughs> figure out where you're going. That's true, so GPS is a great use for satellites, yeah? Um, um, what parts of satellites are made of molybdenum? Molybdenum? Well, molybdenum is a component of steel. Steel is very heavy, and we don't use much steel. We use a lot of titanium, because titanium, just like your nice, very expensive bicycles, it's lightweight and strong. So mostly we use titanium, beryllium, and gold. Those would be the primary metals, yep, I think. Somebody can correct me, because I might be, you know, making things up. <laughs> well, aluminum is a really great conductor, I think, not a conductor, but it, it expands and contracts a lot with hot and cold. So because of that, you don't want to use that in space. But we use it a lot with modeling. And Ball also does a lot of an, um, things on aircraft, especially fighter jets, and those are the optics that we use for fighter jets is a lot of that is made out of aluminum. And so um, 
If you guys have ever seen the helicopters in Iraq with this big funny eye thing out the top, that's actually the night vision goggles for helicopters, and Ball makes those too. Oh, the thing that sticks out really far, and then there's like a little red dot. Mm, I thought it kind of looked like owl eyes. But anyway, they stick out of the top of the helicopter. So Ball also makes those, and they make um, star trackers and a whole lot of different things. But I work mostly in satellites. And antennas too for, for fighters. You yep. A lot of aluminum. OK. Yes? How many satellites are there? Oh, thousands. There's a lot. I don't know, maybe. And there's a lot. OK, actually, Space Trunk is actually kind of a good, interesting topic. So recently, NASA realized that there's actually too much, they call it debris, up in space. They call it the debris field. So now, when we launch a satellite, not only do we have to do an analysis of how our satellites will survive the debris field, but we also have to make sure that we don't add to the debris field, right? And so actually now many of our <laughs> satellites are covered in Kevlar. Do you guys know what Kevlar is? Bulletproof vests. Isn't that funny? It's because like um, when astronauts lose their glove or something on the satellites, it's really dangerous because it will come around and then it will go straight through the satellite. It can, like a frozen chicken through an airplane. <laughs> There is not a cost-effective way to get rid of space junk. That's the thing is it's very expensive. So when they decided to fix Hubble, part of it was because we really like Hubble and it's a great public relations instrument and people like it so much. But it is actually not cost-effective to go fix it. It would have been cheaper to send another one up. But they also wanted to figure out how much it would cost, if it was possible. So it is not very cost-effective to go up and gather things out. But if you can figure it out, which you might, you will have an excellent job. <laughs> so, what do you have? <laughs> you just speak louder, what? What other names are there for the satellites? Other names for satellites? Well, think of all the uses for satellites, right? We have navigation. The Apollo. Apollo, that's right. So you guys have heard of the Mars mission? Oh yeah, what, 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 it was a, that's not the one I'm thinking of, it's the older one, it's the... How about New Horizons that went past Pluto? No. No. Good job. So there's a lot of different, there's, satellites are used for so many things. They're used to look at the Earth, spying, right? They're certainly used in the military all the time. Right? They're used, all of us use them probably. That's how I found the restaurant I went to tonight. Right? So, and of course we'd like to talk to each other. Right? And most of those are off towers, but some of them are off satellites. So especially if you're up in Alaska, we get a lot of, use a lot of satellite phones. Yeah? Um, I know we're kind of on satellite topic, but mm -hmm. what about the um, space, like the cars, whatever? The rover? Yeah. Mars rover? Yep, yeah, Ball worked on the Mars rover. Well, what, what's the one that just went up, like, and it had a two year mission? Mm, I don't know. It came out in, like, 2014, maybe, I think. Talking about spirit and opportunity? Yeah, our, 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 okay, opportunity. Yeah, opportunity. It is 12 plus years later. Cool work, yeah, <laughs> and actually, that's a great thing. So. One of the, so my primary job at Ball is I actually, yeah, I work in the testing. We do so much testing of the satellites. We test it at every level. Because unlike your car, it's really hard to go fix it. So you don't want to just be sending up a blob of very expensive stuff that doesn't work. So you test it, and you test it, and you test it. <laughs> I had a Fiat, and that is pretty accurate. So, yeah, so. Yeah? What? I'm guessing it's like 150 times. We <coughs> test it at every level. And every time you put something new on it, you test it again. So we test all the electronics. We test the solar rays. We test the batteries. We test it all together. You test it in parallel. We put it on a vibration table, and we shake it. 
and we shake it really hard because launch is a very, very violent episode. So if you go to the NASA website, you can see that they put it in a capsule that looks like a giant <coughs> bullet. They stick it in there, then they strap it to a rocket, so they bolt it on with explosive bolts, they send it up, and if you've ever seen a video of launch, I mean, it is loud and it is violent, and then they explode the, the bolts to get the two separated. It is a very violent event. That's how come the satellites have to be very hearty. Yes? And how to get on the space junk. Yes. Um, it's pretty hard um, to reach it, but dump it in a black hole. You know, but it's pretty close to Earth, and I'm not fond of being right next to black holes. I think it could make my wrinkles worse. Because, no, because <laughs> if it, like, if you somehow live through the black hole, Earth would be the size of a pen tip. Well, I think you should talk to that guy right there. Because he's an astrophysicist, and he probably could answer any questions you have about that. All I'm thinking is, is that I would prefer not to have a black hole near our nice little planet. So, right. yeah? Why don't you just take a giant net up to space to collect all the space junk? Why don't you think about that a lot more? <laughs> Let me check my hands, and we'll get the next group going. Oh, they're getting closer. They're not quite boiling. So, yes? I have a question. You have a question? So how do you make sure you get all the air out of the satellites that they don't blow up and get outer space? Well, in fact, we cook them, <laughs> sort of. We put them in a giant vacuum chamber. So we have almost this exact same setup, but much more elaborate, made out of steel at Ball that we call Brutus, it's huge. And we, so not only do we create a vacuum, we do it at every component level. So everything that goes on the satellite is put through a vacuum before it ever gets integrated onto the satellite. And so what we do is we make the electronics or we make the cables, so the cables are sort of like the um, circulatory nervous system of the satellite. All of them, when, before they're put on the satellite, are put into a vacuum chamber and put at a high temperature, cold temperature, and under a vacuum, cycled, to make sure that all of the volatiles are off of it. And it has to be super duper clean, because what you really want is not to have anything on the satellite, um, especially the optics. Oh, I don't have a picture of that. So whenever we go into the room, the clean room that has the satellite, you have to be completely garbed so that none of your skin particles or hair are loose in the room. And in fact, you're not allowed to wear perfume or anything that is vo can volatilize into the clean room because it could contaminate the optics. So all of the and it depends on which program, because some are cleaner than others. It depends if it's an infrared satellite, it depends on the visual array. So some of them, and especially like our antennas, they don't have to be nearly as clean. And like our space-based surveillance, it had to be super duper duper clean. And so we really, it was just phenomenal how much cleaning we did. I spent a lot of time cleaning. <laughs> so which I do at my own house, so I wasn't that excited to do at work. So you haven't asked a question for a while. Brutus is a lot bigger than James Webb, but actually, James Webb is such a big satellite, it is not being tested at Ball. It's going to Northrop Grumman to be tested because they have a much bigger chamber. And same thing at Lockheed Martin. Well, where's our Lockheed guy? I think Lockheed has a much bigger chamber than Ball does. So it just depends. Uh, Ball does a lot more research satellites, which tend to be smaller. Although it's getting bigger, we have a couple satellites now that we actually had made Brutus bigger with a ring. Go ahead. Okay. Like when they break or something? Or okay, so what are glasses made out of? And then I have a question for you. Plastic. Plastic. Okay, so what would happen to the glass? Probably break. Probably nothing. They might warp. What? 
Yeah, I mean, look at this. Do not let him put his glasses. Yeah, so, okay. So I have another question for you. What if we put an alarm in there? A ringing alarm. It would blow up. It would probably just do nothing. Make noise. You wouldn't hear it at all. That's correct. You would not hear it at all. I have an alarm. Well, it would not be good for the plastics of your alarm. That's fine. <laughs> and I don't think my vacuum's actually strong enough, but actually, if you have an alarm, I've never tried it. <laughs> so I'm happy to try it. So let's set it one minute. Okay. All right, well, good. So it's not good for your thing, but what the heck? Hit start. Hit start? Oh, hit start. You know, on one minute before it starts raining. Okay. Oh, there, it's counting down. It'll ring for one minute. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're at 35 seconds. Is it going to be too much of a vacuum to hear it before it starts going off? I've never done it before. We'll see. 25. <laughs> Sit down. 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. I cannot hear it. Now I'm a little deaf. Here, you come up here. Can see if you can hear it. Okay, so which one of you has not imploded the pop can? Okay, come on up. Oops, where'd my... Here they are. Hold on, we're going in line. Okay. So, you saw how they did it. With your dominant hand, just pick it up gently, turn it over, and submerge it in the water. Oh, you can't let go. But you did it. All right. Next, you gonna come? Do you wanna do it? Okay. Okay, so just gently pick one up. Pick it up. Good job. You did, you smashed it. All right, Emmy, give me these. Thank you. All right, next. Don't touch the burner. There you go. It's hard because you have to get a you have to get a seal. No. All right, next. One of you guys want to, there you go. Try not, don't touch the burner. There you go. And grab it a little, yeah, like that. Good job. And you just feel it suck right in there. Oops, that's all right, I'll get it. Thank you. Here, I got it. All right, next. You ready? All right, here, hold on, let me. So you're right-handed or left-handed? Right. Okay, don't grab, don't touch the burner. Don't touch the burner, grab it a little higher. There you go. There you go, good job. Crushed it. Oh, okay, yep. Well, I have actually, 
I raided all of the pop cans I could find today in the recycling. My colleagues think I'm a little crazy. I was going to ask who drank all of those cans. I don't even really drink pop. And you can feel it just pull right in. There you go. All right, girls, you guys aren't gonna come? No? All right, come on up. And I'll eat up some more for the adults. <laughs> just because you're not a kid doesn't mean you can't play with the pop cans. You got it? Okay, so what you do is you just wanna, about midway, grab the pop can. Uh-huh, don't squeeze too hard. Now, quickly turn it over and submerge the end. Oh. Yep, there you go. You lost it. It's gone. <laughs> it did. It crashed. It created a seal. So I'm going to load up five more pop cans. So, yeah. So, and, the, and when I saw it at CU, that's actually how I thought to do this, is I saw them do a oil barrel about like that. So, and it worked exactly the same. So... Yeah? So do you get you have another question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Are we gonna talk about stars a star's light? Actually I am not, but there are other people who are gonna talk to you about the observatory and then let you use the telescope upstairs. Well, yeah. While she's heating up the cans. <laughs> it's getting pretty nice out there. The moon's gonna come up past the clouds here in a few minutes. But it's really clearing off nicely overhead, so we should be able to see Jupiter and some other pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Okay. And you, what's your question? Who's James Webb? I believe he's a physicist. Is that right? You guys. He's also a former director of NASA. Former director of NASA. Yeah? I can't hear you. When are we done? Almost done. So I'm going to eat up some more cans. And do you guys, you young people in the back, if you would like to implode some cans, you are more than welcome to come up and do it. So why don't you explain about what you guys are going to do, and I'll heat up some more cans. <laughs>